to suggest to all of you that are um, joining us or leaving us that we are very, very thrilled to work with The Atlantic, um, who's been our partner in the Aspen Ideas Festival from the beginning. Between their website, theatlantic.com, and our website, aifestival.org, you'll be able to track everything that we're doing online, and I hope you'll join us in the conversation and share these with your friends. I'd also like to take a moment to thank uh, our sponsors, whom without we would not be able to produce the Aspen Ideas Festival. And thankfully, in a time of great recession, there's such an enthusiasm for deep conversation that sponsorship is uh, welcome here and very, very much um, on board with us. And we're indebted to these organizations for helping us. And these are Allstate, Altria, Applied Materials, Booz Allen Hamilton, Ernst & Young, Hewlett Packard, Mercedes-Benz, Shell, Thomson Reuters, and U.S. Trust. If we could give them a hand, they've been making this possible. Thank you. Across the last several days, we've been talking about a number of subjects. One of them is education, and the other is race in America. And you'll find, if you've not been on, online yet, or if you were in these conversations, that they are very related. And we decided that we would bring two individuals to Aspen to discuss the achievement gap. One many of you may have seen last night and been introduced to, who is the most remarkable educator and advocate for children, I think, that maybe lives in the United States, Mr. Jeffrey Canada, who is the CEO and the head of the Harlem Children's Home. And the second is the youngest African American ever to get tenure at Harvard University. Can I introduce you, please, to Roland Fryer, professor of economics. <laughs> I really don't like being on panels with Jeff, because uh, as you heard, she says, he's the most remarkable person in the world, Jeff Canada. <laughs> Here's some nerd from Harvard, Roland Fryer. <laughs> So let me, let me just get us started about, I, I know everyone here understands um, the importance of education, uh, but let me just give you a few facts that you might not know. If you just look at racial inequality in America, and that's something I'm very interested in, uh, blacks earn about 39% less uh, full-time workers than whites. If you look at things like um, uh, incarceration, two times more likely to be incarcerated on any given day. Uh, if you look at health, uh, life expectancy, six-year difference in life expectancy uh, between different racial groups. Now, I don't want to depress you because it's too early in the day, but here's the, the wonderful thing about it, and here's what gives us hope. If you just look at eighth grade test scores, okay, just eighth grade test scores, that 39% difference in wages goes down to about 10%. That uh, doubling of incarceration goes down as well. The six years in life expectancy goes down to two years. So it won't get rid of all the social ills that we have in America, of course, but if there was one bullet, education certainly would be it. That's what got me interested in education. The issue, as you all know, is that we haven't been able to close the racial achievement gap. It doesn't exist when kids are nine months old, but it, you know, uh, quickly, uh, the, the trajectories of black and white children quickly diverge after that. And by the time that kids are uh, 13, there's a one standard deviation difference, one standard deviation is a big number, between uh, racial groups in terms of how well they can do math and how well they can read. If you look at places like Washington, D.C., four and a half percent of those kids can read at grade level, four and a half percent according to the National Association of Education Progress. In Detroit, it's 3%. I'm not making this up. 3%. So I got involved in education, got depressed like everyone else, and then discovered the Harlem Children's Zone. And I heard a lot about this guy, Jeff Canada. And people said, man, Jeff is so amazing. He is so, uh, he's so wonderful. You just have to meet Jeff. And I met Jeff, and Jeff gave me his data. Uh, and I told Jeff, I said, you know, if you're not working and you're just a smooth guy, I'm going to tell everybody. 
<laughs> he did say that. He did. <laughs> I told him, I said, because I care about kids much more than I care about you, because we just met. <laughs> you can see I have a good effect on people. I'm more of an acquired taste. Jeff is not. <laughs> So when we analyze Jeff's data, here's what we found, and I'm, I don't know how he does it, Jeff's going to tell you that, but in three short years, kids who came in to his sixth grade, he erased the racial achievement gap in New York City in three years. So kids who were coming in reading at second grade level, third grade level, and sixth grade, by the time they were eighth graders, he had erased the achievement gap with kids, uh, um, with other racial groups in New York City. And that was in math. He did something very similar in English language arts. And for kids he has that are younger, they've not only um, erased the achievement gap, they're passing the average kids in New York City when he actually gets them younger. I have no idea how he does it, but I guess today he's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on in the Harlem Children's Home. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was introduced uh, to Roland Fryer, uh, and they told me that uh, he was a, a boy genius uh, actually, Roland told me that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but the, thing, the thing that I found intriguing was uh, that they said that Roland was searching for the truth and he didn't care where that led. Uh, and so that all of the politically correct stuff, none of it mattered to him at all. He was really looking for the truth. And he did come up to me and say, I heard your stuff was good, I hope it's true but you know I'm going to tell the truth uh, no matter what I found. Uh, and I told him, if it, if it doesn't work, I actually want to know about it. Uh, I've been looking at this achievement gap issue uh, literally my whole life, and, and, and I mean that. Uh, when I was in elementary school in the 50s, people didn't pretend that all kids could learn. You were tracked starting, and I, I found out about it starting about the second grade. <clears throat> you went, and it was very obvious. You went. To two one or two two or two, and everybody understood what those numbers meant, and we kids understood what it meant. And once you were in, then you stayed in. And we would lose one or two kids a year, and one or two kids would move from one two one to two two, uh, and it just stayed like that. And I was amazed that they could be so wrong. I have an older brother, Dan, uh, and this is one of the issues in education. Uh, people thought I was smart because I answered any question that you asked me immediately, right? Just, you have to ask me something, I would just, my brother Dan used to think about it. People said he was slow, right? <laughs> this is, no, I'm being, but you see, I'm being honest, right? You would ask Dan a question, he'd think, oh, no, 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 that boy put him in the six, five class because he's slow. Now my brother happens to, you know, be a nuclear engineer today, but <laughs> it's, this is true, but that is despite that is despite what the teachers believed about him. Uh, and so in the seventh grade, we went from special progress classes to 722. You have to understand what this does. Now, if you were in 75, there was already doubt that you would graduate high school. 710, we knew you weren't going to graduate from high school. 718, 720, I just never, and it was the majority of children were in those classes. Somewhere people found out that that was a bad thing for kids, at least to tell them, right? So we changed all the things so you can't tell, even though we do exactly the same thing, that people have the same beliefs. Uh, when we, I didn't want to do schools. When I came in to do the zone, we did all the other supports and services, but I always felt the answer was to reform public schools, that that was the only answer, because that's where all the kids are at, right? So after doing everything, I couldn't get the schools in my zone to listen to me. I would go in and say, look, you guys, come on. If you get earlier and you work with the neighbors, say, Jeff, you don't understand what it's like to run a school in Harlem. And I kept hearing, you don't understand. So I finally I went to Joe Klein, who was chancellor. I said, Joe, look, uh, I want to do a management with you where we manage schools together, where uh, we get 50% of the vote and you get 50%. And I went through this long, elaborate thing, and Joe just started laughing at me, right? He says, Jeff. By the time we get that legislation passed to do that, we will both be old and retired. Do a charter school. And I didn't want to do a charter school, because I had done schools, and doing schools is no fun. It's a lot of work. But there was no other way for me to answer the question when people said, but you don't know how hard it is or why this is impossible because you don't run schools. 
Now, I would love to say uh, that I was a genius in figuring out how to close this achievement gap. And believe me, if I was, I would admit it to you all, my closest friends. I wouldn't tell everybody, but I would certainly tell you all in here if I was a genius. No, you know what? The sad thing is that what we did, in my opinion, was so simple that when I think of the decades of kids, I'm 58, there have been schools failing since I was a kid, 50, 60 years. When I think about the, the damage that has done to children, it's really very sad to me. So, so what was the big secret? Uh, the first thing was we thought if kids are behind, they probably need a longer day. I call it the physics of education, meaning that uh, if your kid is two years behind, uh, it's not like all the other middle class kids say, let's wait here for Jeff's kids to catch up, right? They're learning and we're trying to get kids to learn. I tell people, to help people understand this, you ever learn something in school that you say, I'll never use this? If a train left Denver at seven o'clock in the morning, <laughs> traveling east, right? and another train left Denver at 12 o'clock in the afternoon traveling east. Both trains are traveling 30 miles an hour. I when use that train this morning. B, <laughs> I use that all the time. <laughs> catch train A. Never. The physics doesn't work in education. How is it, now that, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. How is it if I have a school that I know 70% of my kids are two years behind? I think in the same school year, the same amount of time, I'm going to solve that equation. It has never worked. It, and you know what the answer is all over America? Uh, when, when people can't do it, they fire the superintendents. The superintendents, if you look at superintendent, their job expectancy is about 18 months. Because after a while, people figure they can't do it. And, and I thought, because I'm from New York City and we think that's the center of the world, that when we fired them in New York City, that that was the end of their career. Nope, they went from New York to Pittsburgh, and from Pittsburgh out to Florida. I mean, they just travel around. The same people, they're still in the business. They're still great. Uh, the problem is we won't talk about this issue of the time, right? How much time does it take to catch a kid up? Now, I'll ask you this question. You have a kid who's a year behind in math. What are you going to do? You get a tutor, you get some help, you're going to come in and say, look, you got to help my kid. I mean, this is not like rocket science that we figure this out. Why won't schools do it? Uh, the other issue we did uh, was we decided that some teachers, and this gets me in trouble, I'm going to get in trouble, some teachers can't teach. <laughs> that, I, I know, that's like a radical, I know, look, people hate me all over America for saying that. It's a radical thought that some teachers, and, and my, my son, my oldest son, who's a lawyer, called me up one day. He said, uh, Dad, uh, all my friends are mad at, at you. I said, why are your friends mad at me? He said, because you said we should send all the lousy teachers to the upper middle class neighborhoods. Now, of course, <laughs> all of his friends are upper middle class. I said, but well, they didn't get the whole quote correct. What I said was, if we can't fire them, then we should send them to the upper middle class <laughs> neighborhoods, right? because those kids can afford a year of a lousy teacher. Poor kids can't afford it. So why would we do that to them? So this issue of uh, do you hold yourself accountable? Uh, we hold ourselves accountable. If the kids don't learn, now this is a given. Now this is Harlem. So let me give you all the givens. Single parents, that's a given. Poverty, that's a given. Crime, given. Substance abuse is a given. Dysfunctional family, that's a given. All of those are given. So when you come to interview with me for a job, I say, do you know this community? You say, yes. I say, you know, this was, oh, they say, Jeff, crime, drugs. Can you educate children despite that? Yes. Well, then, that's it. Then I don't want to hear anything in four months. When you come in, I say, look at the score. These kids aren't doing so well. Oh, Jeff, you've been to their homes? Oh, wait, 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 wait. We had that discussion. You said you knew about that, right? If you allow excuses in this business, you will fail. I will tell you, there is a whole science really designed around why you can't educate these kids. Uh, here's a very simple thing. If you fire everybody who doesn't succeed with the kids, you either end up with no one working for you or a program that works, right? We ended up with a program that works. Uh, everybody in the end understands failure is not an option. 
So what happens if you're going to fail in your job, right? You have a job, you fail, you don't work weekends. Do you have a job that you could fail and take three months off? Just like, oh, I'm, look, I know, I know I didn't do a good job, but I'm not coming back till like September, right? I mean, that's like crazy. Uh, only in education can you have those kind of things. So look, our work, Roland, our work is in a small, small charter schools. The real challenge in America is can we reform public education? Can we get the same things that we've learned in charter schools and public schools? And the only person I know who's really attempting to do that in America is Roland. Uh, and and he's, I, I, he, I thought he was smarter than this because he's decided not just to be a professor at Harvard, but to now take over some schools and actually do what no one else has been able to do. So you may want to say something about that, Roland. Sure. No, I thought that's what tenure was for, man. <laughs> <laughs> On the job retirement, that's what I call it. No, you know, let me just back up. Jeff's right. This is exactly what we're doing, trying to figure out how to take uh, programs like the Harlem Children's Zone, KIPP, Yes, aspire and take them to scale in normal, in regular, traditional public schools, and that, that's hard. Um, I, I told um, Jeff's wife the first time I met her, I said, "What I really like to do is boil Jeff down to pill form, so we can transport him around." And she's like, "That, that boy got problems." Um, so here's kind of what we did when, when I first got involved in education. Um, the facts I told you about before were interesting to me, and when I realized education was so important for those uh, social ills, I said, well, I want to get involved. The craziest thing about education to me, I mean, and you've said a lot about a lot of it, is frankly the lack of rigor that we hold ourselves to when we try to understand what's actually working and what's not. Uh, I was trained, as I'm sure you how, how really nerdy I am. I, as an undergraduate, I was a mathematician and, and I've um, got a PhD in economics. But it wasn't until I got involved in education until I heard about the cardiac test. Have you heard about this? Now, I've heard of T-test, I've heard of separating hyperplane theorem, but I've never heard of the cardiac test until I got involved in education. I would go around all these schools and I would say, wow, this is an interesting after school program. And they would say, oh, yeah, it's working. I said, well, is, is it really working? They say, oh, yeah, it's really working. I say, well, how do you know? And they'd say, we can feel it in our heart. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that might be all right for your children, but for my kids, I want some numbers. You know I mean? Could you imagine going to a doctor and they say, you know, well, you know, a little fever. Here's some pills my buddy gave me. I think they work, right? You'd run out of there. <laughs> But in education, that's okay. So we created this lab to say, okay, we want to, you know, put science into education, do everything as, um, uh, as pilot programs and rig rigorously measure what they're doing. After we met Jeff, we said, well, we don't want to do that anymore, right? Uh, I think it was Gauss, the famous mathematician, who said, once you have two examples, you basically have a proof. And with Jeff's work, with Kip's work, with other people's work, we have a series of examples. The question is, how can we boil down these wonderful things that are going on in charter schools and try to figure out how to scale them in public schools? And so we've started down that path, and I'll tell you about it, and, then, and Jeff's been intimately involved. Uh, he's, he's really been an advisor on this project to me from day one. Uh, and the first thing we did was we went and started videotaping people uh, uh, in schools, in, in highly successful and not so successful charters, because there's some charters that are fantastic and others should be closed. Okay. And what we wanted to do was look at the variance, if you will, okay. uh, in charter success and figure out if there are a few things that could predict that success. Okay. So longer school days, how you use data to drive instruction, et cetera. And the preliminary evidence is that there are essentially four or five things that kind of come out of this uh, that can predict a lot of the success in charters. One is more time in school. Uh, Jeff's kids spend a whole lot of time in school. In fact, when I was visiting his elementary school, <laughs> I told the principal, I said, I'd like you to buy me lunch. He said, why would I buy you lunch? I said, because if you don't, I'm going to tell your kindergartners that the other kids aren't spending this much time in school. <laughs> he said, come on, man, don't tell them that. <laughs> More time in school, very, very important. The second thing is obviously the human capital piece, right? Uh, getting great teachers in the classroom. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just obvious. The third thing, though, uh, which, which Jeff didn't touch upon, is how he uses data to drive instruction and other high-performing charter schools as well. Right? Assessing kids every three weeks or so with soft-touch assessments, 
breaking the assessments down by skill, so he knows or I know if uh, a certain kid doesn't understand linear equations with one unknown, and then reteaching when you don't know. In a lot of public schools, you just kind of go and go and go, and then we give you a test in March, you get the results in June, and then school's out, right? So this is frequent assessments, low touch, using the data to actually drive instruction uh, and make sure that kids get mastery. Um, the fourth thing is essentially, how do you differentiate instruction? Some people do it because they have phenomenal teachers. And if, you have a phen if you've really seen a phenomenal teacher, it is a work of art. I mean, they are amazing, right? I mean, the kid starts slashing and says, eyes on me, and they're just going and going. And, and they can teach the five different levels in a classroom of 30, and everybody is on task. That's what, Jeff, one, two percent yeah, of teachers? That's, that's about, that's <laughs> right, so putting one of those teachers in every classroom is tough. So, you know, um, the Harlem Children's Zone schools and other schools use other ways of differentiating instruction by putting kids in small groups, et cetera. And the last piece really is the wraparound services uh, that Jeff gives uh, and other types of investments um, and the culture and the expectations that a lot of folks have. And the culture and expectations really have to be baked in to every single thing the school does, right? I mean. You can't, it's not like the 1980s when we had like quality departments, right? Um, department of quality. You can't have just a bucket that says, hey, at some point we're gonna think about culture. Culture has to be embedded in every single thing. So here's what we're doing. We found from um, these charters that these are kind of things that are correlated with achievement. I think the next step is to try to translate that into public schools. So we are taking 20 public schools, because I'm a nerd, they've been randomly chosen, um, in a large city, and we're taking these four or five things and we're putting those things in the actual public schools. So we've linked in the school day. School now in these schools starts from 7.30 and ends at 4.30, okay? They go half days on Saturday, right? We've got data-driven instruction. They've got tutors. Every kid in this school is gonna get a period where there's two-on-one tutoring to be able to differentiate the instruction. For those who we don't tutor, we're gonna double dose them if they're behind grade level. So you get more time in school, but more effective time in school. And we're working hard to, to find leaders for these schools and to uh, train the principals and get great teachers, et cetera. And when I went into the schools, I asked the uh, you know, all the teachers, I, I, I try to do my best Jeff Canada impression, which I'm not very good at. I mean, don't do this stuff at home that he's doing. I've tried to do that. My grandmother was an educator for 37 years, and I'll say stuff like, Grandma, we got to kick out these teachers. She's wow, whoop. <laughs> That's what Jeff said. <laughs> so we're going in, and we've gone into the school, and we interviewed all the teachers. And I really was blown away, because, you know, I, I, I'm an, I know you guys think I'm like this ivory tower academic, but, you know, in, in my world, I'm like the most applied guy around. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the schools, and I'm talking to the teachers, and, you know, I said, what do you need to turn this school around? You've got 29% of kids scoring at grade level. And just a footnote here, what does it mean to score at grade level? That means you've got to get 28% of the questions right. Now, if you just put down A, that's about 25% of it. <laughs> so that means the marginal value of this teacher is not about 3%. Okay, I'm back up to the main text. But that's, doesn't that make you furious? I mean, you could just put down A. I mean, a Doberman with a pencil could get 23%. So I asked the teacher, I said, what do you need? I said, because we're thinking of longer school days, we're thinking about uh, differentiating instruction through tutoring, we're thinking about data-driven instruction. What do you need? You know what a lot of teachers told me? Smarter kids. I, I was blown away. But we absolutely not only can do this, we have to do this. If this were cancer research, and you realize that 12 cancer facilities, one in the Harlem Children's Zone, one at KIPP, one at YES, et cetera, had found cures to cancer, the whole field would ascend on those centers and figure out what they're doing so that they can help everybody else out because they're dying of cancer. In education, it's weird to me that we've now got these examples. We're trying to scale them up in this city, Jeff. Not a lot of other folks are trying this stuff. And people are still saying, well, I don't know, Roland, you might be able to take those four things, but I don't know, I kind of like computers. <laughs> We're not working together. We're not figuring out if we do this thing right, we can take what Jeff has done, we can take what Kip has done, we can create, don't run out on me, we can create a vaccine for education.
we want to get this right. Yeah. I think. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we have a choice. I'm, the, the thing that frustrates me the most, I think, Roland, in our work uh, is uh, the uh, absolute unwillingness of, uh, I think, a lot of folk in this business to try innovation. Uh, you know, you just had uh, Bill Gates up here, and I heard the question about devices, and you begin to talk about it. They have no choice but to innovate. You will be, I mean, you know, just ask, uh, uh, Blackberry, right? I mean, you, you, you'll just be toast in almost any other place except in education. In education, when someone innovates, everybody piles on to say it's no good. Even if it doesn't work, we should be trying something. And a lot of stuff doesn't work when people do it. But we should be trying something saying, in the end, we do know these kids can learn. We just have to be smart enough about figuring out the answers. Uh, and so I think that, that we're on uh, right now the uh, forefront of a movement in this country which says something very simple. If children don't learn, it's our fault. It is not the children's fault, it's not the family's fault, it's not the community's fault, it's those of us in the business, and we've got to be smarter about doing our job. When you ask people what does it take, right, to educate a child, uh, you don't want the answer, smarter kids. Uh, because people really believe, no, this is, but I know Roland's not joking, because people really believe this. And they say to me, well, yeah, because if we, we, if we were down below 96th Street, we'd be able to do that too, right? So what is that saying? Well, we think the kids down there are somehow different than the kids we have right here, instead of, you know what, uh, we need to do a better job. Now, I know uh, we've got uh, uh, only two minutes. They've already given me the sign. He, oh, gave, really? he gave me the sign. He had a sign. It was like a black power thing. Roland and I <laughs> say, don't get that wrong, right? <laughs> we might say some good, you might come out, you know, and we be leaving the state. So, so here, here's, here's what I think, here's what I think uh, that we have to do as a nation. Uh, we have to decide that education uh, is a civil right. Uh, that it really is a civil right, that, that everyone in this country deserves an opportunity to get an education, and that those of us who are in the field, that you have to hold us accountable for that. Uh, I think they absolutely have the right, to, not, not only to, uh, to an education, but to be educated. And, and, and the other thing I would say is, we also have to, to just get rid of the excuses. Well, we can't educate this person because they come from poverty, or their mother's not with them, or their father's not with them, or whatever. You know, or the parents. That, I hear that all the time. Even no excuses, people say, well, I don't have any excuses, Rob, but have you seen their parents? And I tell them, look, the parents sending you the best kid they got. They're not hiding the good ones at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll homeschool you, you go to school. So we're going to have to not only decide, but get a little upset about it. And if we put these things together, the things that are going on in charter schools, which are the biggest developments in education in the last 50 years, and we get serious about our methods and say, if it's good enough for the medical folks, it's good enough for our children, I have zero doubt when we come back in five, ten years, we would have solved this problem. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree with uh, Roland Moore. Uh, let, me, let me just say uh, three things that I think people uh, get confused. Uh, Roland and I both understand how difficult uh, and wondrous teaching is. This is really not an, an anti-teacher issue. Uh, this just really says that we need to have teachers prepared and capable and committed to do the job. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this is not about charters versus no charters. We want great schools for all American kids. Uh, and we just think charters allow more innovation. But public schools, you see, in any other business, public schools would be looking and saying, uh, if they've got an iPad, we're going to invite men an iPad. We're going to get one better. Instead, they're like, take the iPad and let's get rid of that thing, right? We really need to, to have public schools accept the fact that we're not against public schools. This is not an anti-public school rant. This is like we all have to get on top of our jobs. Uh, and then the third thing is that we have to remove uh, the people whose job it is 
to keep education from changing. Uh, there is jobs involved in making sure nothing changes, and that has to be eliminated so that we can bring education to a change. Uh, by the way, uh, we think that Roland and I can do all that we can on this issue, and we will do that. Roland will be doing it a lot longer than I will because he's a lot younger than me. Uh, but in the end, if you all uh, don't raise a stink about this, uh, everything we do is not going to matter. So let's all do this together, and thank you all very much. <laughs>